Good afternoon. Welcome to Marin Voices and Views. I'm Lawrence Allen Strick, today without Peter B. Collins. It's rare that Marin Voices and Views has a solo host. However, today our guests Sheila Lickbow and Michael Cafino are opponents in a Marin County Superior Court judges race. Peter has done some professional work for one of the candidates and in the interest of fairness, felt he could not be hosting. It's rare that Marin has at all an open judicial race. It's much more common for the governor to make an appointment. This year, however, Judge Faye Diopel announced her retirement, thereby opening a seat. Naturally, an open judge seat in Marin attracted a lot of attention. The field started with nine candidates, and after the June primary, we have our two uh, finalists. Mike Cafino has been an attorney since 1986, excuse me, 1996. I am the only attorney here in the 18, 1800s, 18, <laughs> 1980s. He's currently a deputy public defender and has held that position since 2003. He, in that capacity, he represents individuals who are charged with crimes. He's a criminal lawyer. Sheila has been an attorney since 1993. She has been the deputy Marin County Council since 2006. Her primary practice is representing the county of Marin. Why don't I give you both a minute or two to fill out your resume and introduce yourself. Sheila? Sure. Thank you so much for having me uh, here today. It's, it's really an honor and a privilege. Um, my name is Sheila Lickblau, and I am a candidate for the um, open seat here to be vacated by Judge Diopel. I'm really proud and honored that Judge Diopel has, um, has, is supporting me uh, in my candidacy. Um, my interest in serving as a judge really comes from an interest in wanting to directly serve the public. Right now, I serve the county, which is what I call the second best job in the world. Um, I get to work on a wide variety of county issues, but I don't have that direct connection to the public. So for the last few years, I've been doing a variety of different things, which have really solidified my interest in serving as a judge. Um, one of those things is I serve as a judge pro tem, so I hear the small claims court cases. Um, I also uh, work directly with Marin Legal Aid, and I work in the um, unlawful detainer clinic, so I get to serve clients in that regard. Um, I also do a lot of volunteer work, um, both um, with the Association of Latino Marin Attorneys, also with the um, Marin County Bar Association Public Outreach um, Committee, and um, also as a volunteer in my children's school. Thank you. Mike? Hi. Uh, thanks, Larry. And thanks for having us. No problem. So I've been a lawyer for 20 years, and I started my career as a civil litigator. I worked for two different law firms uh, doing corporate-type law, representing business owners and um, other companies who had uh, commercial disputes. Uh, but in 2001, I left my corporate law job uh, at an Oakland firm, and I went to work as a public defender in the poorest county in California, working there for the poorest people. Uh, and that was in Lake County, which uh, at the time was about 100 miles north of where I was living in Berkeley. And uh, for me, in doing that, I really found my calling as a lawyer. And for the past 15 years, I have uh, devoted myself uh, to helping uh, represent the people who are the most disadvantaged in our legal system. That's folks who are charged with a crime, uh, but who can't afford a lawyer to, uh, to represent them. Um, and currently, I'm a deputy public defender here in uh, Marin County. I've done that for the past 13 years. Uh, and uh, so that's my current position. Good. And he's a new father. And I got to say that Sheila was nice enough to bring a gift for the baby before we went on the air. And I think that that's great. Congratulations and very nice. Um, California has a really large prison system. There are over 30 prisons. I think there's 120, 150,000 prisoners. State needs to feed them, clothe them, provide medical treatment, hopefully some rehabilitative, rehabilitative services for them. What are your views of the California prison system, Mike? And what have you heard that you think are good aspects of it? And what troubles you about the way California handles its prisoners? Yeah. Well, you know, as a public defender here in Marin, I represent a lot of clients at San Quentin State Prison, uh, which, as anybody knows who's driven across the Richmond uh, Bay Bridge, knows is located here in Marin. And uh, the way that happens is that people who are inmates incarcerated at San Quentin who are accused of committing new crimes in the prison uh, typically can't afford to hire a lawyer uh, and they're charged in Marin County Superior Court and the Public Defender's Office is appointed to represent them. 
Uh, I've done more San Quentin jury trials in the past 10 years than any other uh, lawyer in private practice or as a public defender. And what that means is that I've had a chance to go into the prison. And I've been all throughout San Quentin State Prison while investigating the facts of these cases that we get. Um, so I've been to the dining halls, I've been to all the cell blocks and the tiers, and I've been in the cells, and I've been in the infirmary, and just throughout the whole prison on the yards. I think that that gives me a unique perspective on what it means to actually go to prison, you know, beyond the fact of talking to my clients about the experience of being in prison. Um, and, you know, California has overpopulation in its prisons, and Governor Jerry Brown has made efforts through legislation to try to reduce that population so that people who are incarcerated are uh, better served by their time there. You know, ideally, we wouldn't have prisons at all. If everybody could get probation uh, and everybody could be restored to their community without going to prison, that would be best, but that's simply not possible. Some people aren't good candidates for probation, and they need to be in prisons. Uh, but I think that the whole, um, you know, prison system could be improved in terms of treatment for people so that when they are released, they're better equipped to be reintroduced to the community, not commit crimes in the future, and uh, get treatment and other kinds of services that they need. What are your thoughts, Sheila? Yeah, so, uh, you know, Mike is right that, that um, the, there, the, there was a court decision recently um, that ruled that, in fact, the overcrowding in some of the prisons is, you know, just unconstitutional. And so Governor Brown has made efforts to try and reduce that prison population. One of the things that's a really interesting statistic is the fact that over 60 percent of, uh, generally in the state of California, over 60 percent of those who are currently incarcerated are pretrial detainees. Um, and so that does raise an issue as to why do we have so many pretrial detainees? Um, is this an opportunity for, um, for bail reform? Um, you know, and, and, and also looking at the prison population, another interesting thing that I think we're all well aware of is the fact that there's a disproportionate number of minorities incarcerated. I am a strong believer in restorative justice. I am a strong believer that um, there are alternative ways of dealing with um, people who either commit crimes, um, in particular first offenders, where we can talk about ways in which we can um, uh, find alternatives to just putting people behind bars. You, you both mentioned bail, and to many in the criminal justice community, uh, bail seems like the new frontier of criminal justice reform. Mm -hmm. uh, every day in California, people, thousands of people are arrested. Some are innocent, most of them are poor, unfortunately. And when they finally get to see a judge, jail, uh, bail is often set at a, at a rate that they're not just going to be able to make. So they're going to have to borrow or get involved with the bail bond system. Um, what do you see uh, as uh, the possibilities of bail reform? And do you believe judges have any role to perform in the reform movement? Or is that something solely an issue for the legislature? Yeah, I mean, bail is... Uh a very problematic area, and it's, uh, it's a place where discrimination, I think, uh, shows itself quite a lot. First of all, against poor people, uh, because if you're accused of a crime, you're entitled to the same rights and the same um, kind of due process as anybody, whether you're rich, poor, or otherwise. And yet, if you're a pretrial detainee, in other words, you're accused of a crime, but you haven't yet been found guilty, and you can't make bail, you're going to be incarcerated, essentially in the same conditions as somebody who has already been convicted of that crime. And the fact is that minorities also suffer discrimination when judges make the decision about how much bail ought to be set in a case. Um, first of all, it is kind of a bizarre thing to assign a monetary sum to a particular person and a particular act that that person is accused of. But that's the system that we have and have to live with. Judges, though, uh, have to be aware of not only uh, you know, a racial bias that might come out, but that the fact that there's kind of implied or um, unconscious bias um, that has been shown to exist in judges who might think that they're otherwise neutral. You know, I think that what you want in a judge who's setting bail is somebody who has experience with many, many thousands of cases. Um, and that's where I spend my working life, is in the courtroom, you know, witnessing and participating in the life of the courtroom. And setting bail is something that you can only do intelligently if you know where in the kind of continuum of seriousness a particular person and the particular allegations fall. And that's where having the experience that I have, uh, having represented thousands of clients in criminal court, helps in giving me a good perspective as a judge on where you know, this case ranks in this kind of hierarchy of seriousness. Yeah, yeah. I, I, have a, I have a problem intellectually with the idea that we actually uh, assign money in order to 
um, determine whether somebody should stay in prison or if they should be released. And I think that there are other evidence-based practices that we can use as a way of uh, determining whether somebody is really a safety risk or not. I, for me, it is very difficult to understand that somebody with a lot of money should be able to be released, whereas somebody who doesn't have money doesn't. And and you know, and I think it's it's um, it's it's pretty obvious that when we when we create a system like this, where uh, we are we are uh, affecting negatively a particular population, and we, which is really people of color. Um, and so uh, I, you know, I understand your question about whether this is this is something that is supposed to be for the legislature to reform, which I really do hope they do. And I think that you know, even the chief justice recently spoke about it um, as needing reform. But I think that judges can also um, exercise some level of discretion and uh, really understanding that money should not be uh, the determinative factor in 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 whether or not you go to prison or not. Um, and, uh, you know, it's something that I strongly believe in. And it's also part of this issue that I think is important, which is cultural competency, because I think that, you know, there is an issue in which judges are potentially um, judging people based on the color of their skin or their background. Um, and, um, and having somebody on the bench who actually is very familiar with cultural competency, somebody like myself who actually grew up um, in a minority household, I think is very important to have on the bench. Another hot issue in the criminal justice world is restorative justice. You both mm -hmm. mentioned it. Uh, over the last several years, Marin County has had various successes with mm -hmm. restorative justice programs. The probation department is very acutely aware of that. Um, and that's where uh, victims are, harms, are harmed, they're harmed, their harms are addressed by the offender and the offender is held accountable. There's some sort of resolution that's to benefit the community. Um, what is your assessment of the role of restorative justice in our community here in Marin? And is there a place for it with adult offenders? Absolutely, absolutely. And, Go ahead. And well, because most of the work has been done with juvenile offenders or in schools or, or not with adults. Uh, my, to my understanding, we really haven't moved into the adult arena at this point. Yeah, I mean, Marin County does have a number of specialty courts that are considered restorative justice courts. We have a court that's directed at helping people who are primarily drug addicts, whose drug addictions have driven their crimes, whether they're property crimes, crimes of violence, or drug crimes. We used to have a veterans court that sought diversion for people who had been in combat and, had, uh, and that had affected their, their behavior. But I mean, the goal in any sentencing, whether it's a restorative justice type sentencing or otherwise, is to restore everybody involved in the process, the victim, uh, the community and the defendant. And that means trying to bring uh, together you know, defendants back into the community once they've, uh, if they've been convicted, serving their time. At the Public Defender's Office, we try to help our clients not just with the immediate uh, legal problems that are presented, but with the underlying social conditions that might have led them to getting arrested. And on behalf of my clients, I'm always thinking about their broader life issues. Is this somebody with a mental illness who could benefit from mental health treatment? Is this person somebody who needs to go into a residential drug treatment program? And the goal there is to avoid these people reoffending, which I have an interest in happening just as much as anybody else. I don't want my clients to get rearrested. So restorative justice should be the goal for every player in the criminal justice system. Yeah, I think that there are certainly some crimes for which restorative justice doesn't work. But there are a whole host of others um, where, um, where restorative justice is appropriate, and not just with the youth, um, but, I, but you know, also with adults. With regard to the youth programs, though, I think it's really important that we continue to strengthen those, um, because you know, these are our kids who are growing up. Um, if, we, uh, if we don't uh, help them at an age where they're vulnerable, um, you know, we could be um, just losing some kids to, um, to, to crime. So I do think it's important that we really emphasize and strengthen in certain ways that particular um, piece of the restorative justice system. And in that regard, we have, of course, our youth court with Don Carney, um, which is a wonderful program. We also um, did do something that we've stopped doing, and I'd like to see it restarted again, which is called the DUI court. And that's where we used to have the courts sometimes go into the high school, uh, high schools and do a, an actual court trial with somebody who was accused and someone who agrees to do that with, you know, with a bailiff, with uh, experts, 
the whole thing and having the high school students serve, serve as a jury, which is an, has been an amazing and very enlightening experience for the, for the high school students. Um, it, we also have brought high school students into the courtroom. So these are ways in which we can really involve the community and also try and look for ways in which we can get the, um, those who have offended understand the impact on the community, um, understand that relationship, and find alternative ways then to putting people behind bars. Un unlike the federal constitution, uh, enshrined in our California state constitution is a, is a citizen's right to a jury trial in a mm -hmm. civil matter. Uh, yet in our modern history and over the course of the last few years, more and more health care providers, companies, service providers are uh, using contracts to usurp the role of the courts and demand private mediation, uh, arbitration. Mm -hmm. Arbitration, they often argue, is faster and cheaper, yet I don't think that's always the case. Uh, and I think arbitration has the potential of creating a two-tiered system, that is, people with money could get to court faster than people who, who can't. What are, in your mind, uh, Sheila, the positive and negative aspects of compelled arbitration? Sure. You know, from a, a, a plaintiff's perspective, I think that if you take away the right to a jury trial, you, um, by contract, um, you have to ensure that uh, the rights of the uh, plaintiff or the person who wants to bring a case um, are not diminished in any way. And it becomes tricky because you know the reason why defendants want to have arbitration most often is to avoid what what they call a runaway jury verdict right and so the the idea is that if you actually get something into arbitration you won't have as many fees and you'll have somebody one person making a decision who will more likely than not uh, award um, a large verdict but try and do something um, a little bit more modest um, but but it really does impact the rights of a plaintiff um, often arbitration is expensive and I know that there are clauses that it, essentially if you try and split the costs of arbitration it, it, it it's unconscionable and so you can't do that the, the defendant has to pay for arbitration for the most part but it still does put a burden I think on the plaintiffs um, one of the things that I, I do, um, while I'm not necessary, I understand why defendants do this. I understand why it might be in certain instances um, beneficial for both parties. But I think that there is a huge risk, and I think that courts need to be very careful to make sure that by way of having an arbitration agreement, you're not diminishing those rights. But one thing I am in favor of is certainly, and it's not, you, sometimes it's contractual, but usually it's also something that the courts encourage, and that is mediation. Um, I think that, that if there is a way for the parties to get together and resolve their disputes without um, taking it to trial, um, there are opportunities for both sides, and I'm definitely in favor of that. I serve as a federal mediator, and, uh, and uh, I think it's something that the courts should continue to, to emphasize. What are your thoughts on compelling arbitration? Well, I'm a criminal practitioner, uh, but I did practice civil law for five years. Uh, you know, the New York Times just did an article about the uh, diminishment in uh, the number of uh, jury trials in general, uh, both in criminal and in civil cases, and interviewed a bunch of federal judges, some of whom had done like two trials in the past uh, four years, and they were lamenting the loss of the jury trial, which really represents the um, apotheosis, if you will, of uh, you know, the citizen's right uh, to due process of law. Um, but you know, the, the whole alternative dispute revolution that started uh, some decades ago was designed to relieve the courts of the burden of adjudicating disputes. The problem is that if you bargain away your rights to trial, um, you may not receive what the law expects you to receive in the way of due process. And uh, you know, that's typically in the civil context. In the criminal context, though, overcharging by DA's offices and the kind of overwhelming um, threat of receiving a terrible sentence in the event you lose operates as a deterrent to 95% of the people who end up in criminal court because those people plead guilty. Um, and that's where sentencing really comes in. And that's where you want a judge who has spent his or her career in the courtroom practicing law and seeing and participating in sentencing hearings because sentencing in criminal court are the main work of what judges do. 95% of people plead guilty don't exercise their right to a trial. Um, they, you know, voluntarily do that by waiving the right to a trial because they perceive that there's a benefit in doing so. But then it's up to the judge to impose a fair sentence. And in doing that, you really want a judge who has uh, spent, you know, 
his or her career in the courtroom and spent decades or at least years in the courtroom and can think of alternative you know, types of sentences, be more flexible, and also have a knowledge, again, a kind of a, a data set of understanding about um, you know, where a particular case belongs in the kind of spectrum of cases in general that come in front of the court in order to arrive at a fair sentence in relation to other like cases. You know, I'm always uh, surprised when I, when I think about the, the judges that I know here in Marin and around the Bay Area, uh, that they're just kind of ordinary folks generally. Uh, I've known many of them for years and all of a sudden they become a judge and they put on a robe and they're expected to, to think about things a little bit differently. Uh, in, the, in the paper the other day, I noticed that some superior court judge in Connecticut uh, had this case where uh, people brought it uh, regarding state school financing. And his opinion, which he read to the courtroom, and it took him two hours to do it, basically indicted the entire state of Connecticut uh, about uh, having tiers and classism and, and really not making it fair for some of the more ch uh, economically challenged districts. Uh, to have their kids get good education. So theoretically, each of you, should you be uh, selected of a judge, could face a similar problem, this massive problem that affects tens of thousands of people here in Marin and maybe millions all across the state of California. What qualities, uh, Sheila, do you uh, bring to bear that give you the confidence that you could tackle an issue that affects 10, 20,000 people here in Marin? You know, Marin is, people tend to think of Marin as just a wealthy, uh, a wealthy county. That drives me nuts, by the and, way. And it's not. It's, it's not. not. There, are, there are plenty of pockets where um, we have poverty, where we have a diverse population. Um, it is a diverse county. Um, and so, you know, I like to think about my broad base experience as something that I think will serve the bench well, not just professionally, but personally. Um, I think, you know, I always like to quote Justice Sotomayor that says that, she says that mastery of the law is insufficient without an understanding as to how it affects the lives of each and every one of us, which is, I think, part of what you were getting at. Um, and, and so for me, having that broad-based perspective of, you know, when I graduated from law school, I spent five years doing nothing but poverty law, where I represented the poor and disabled people who were, um, who were uh, substance abusers, who were mentally disabled. Um, I, and, and so I've had this broad, this broad base of experience. I've also represented small and large businesses. I've represented, as you mentioned earlier, the county. Um, all of that, I think, really helps in being able to adequately serve the, the, the public. But I also have a, a personal diversity that I think is important for this county. And that, and that personal diversity comes from the fact that my father is from India and my mother is from Puerto Rico. I grew up speaking Spanish. I lived in Puerto Rico for a while. When I was, uh, when I was serving, um, uh, doing poverty law, I was the Spanish-speaking uh, Spanish attorney. In my role as Judge Pro Tem, I've had the opportunity to use my Spanish and to exercise that, um, what I believe is really cultural competency, which I think is important on the bench. Mike? Well, Larry, you know, I'm from New York City, but I grew up here in Marin. I went to Tam High, my aunt and uncle ran a bakery, my mom was a school teacher. Um, in my job, you know, I represent ordinary people in Marin County, poor people. So nobody knows better than me that Marin County has a poor population, indigent, can't afford to hire a lawyer. These are the folks that I represent on a day-to-day -day basis, immigrants, mentally ill people, homeless people, uh, San Quentin State prison inmates. Um, and in doing that, in sticking up for their uh, constitutional rights, which is what my obligation is as a lawyer under the Sixth Amendment, I am sometimes required to make some of the toughest and most consequential decisions that any lawyer can ever make in a case. You know, I've gone to trial in a case where my client faced the possibility of receiving a life sentence if convicted. Uh, and frankly, there's nothing that really focuses the mind uh, like the prospect of your client going to prison for the rest of his life. And I think that making those kind of tough decisions about whether to plead guilty, go to trial, whether to testify, what evidence to put on, those are the kinds of consequential decisions that are directly analogous to what a judge is going to be expected to make uh, from the bench. And I think that having the experience of having been in that stressful situation, um, of having to make a tough decision in view of what the law requires and what the law permits, I don't think that there's any better preparation than that uh, for being a judge. And you know, the final thing I want to mention, because uh, I know we're running out of time, is you, Marin is a unique 
place in the sense of how our uh, judiciary is kind of uh, composed, in that we don't have any judges currently on our bench who spent their careers in a public defender office. Despite that, the vast majority of criminal cases coming through our court system are public defender cases. And in that, Marin really stands alone among the nine Bay Area counties. So if elected, I would, I believe, restore a sense of balance to a uh, judiciary that has no judge on the bench who ever worked in a public defender office in contradistinction with every other county in the Bay Area where it's kind of recognized that it's helpful to have judges that came from varied backgrounds. So we do have very few minutes left. I have two quick questions and I'm going to make them quick. Not every decision a judge make, it makes is, is monumental. Uh, they're regular folks too. So tell me, what's the last book you read and where do you hang out when you're not taking care of your kids <laughs> and judging and lawyering and stuff? I usually, I usually am taking care of my kids, to be uh, honest. I knew that. <laughs> So I spend a lot of time, I mean, I, I do spend time, of course, now I'm, the, the, free the little free time that I have, I spend it um, because it's soccer season. Wow. And so that's, that's honestly where I've been. Um, in terms of the last book I read, you know, I recently picked up a book that I had read a while ago um, called Paula. It's Isabel Allende's book, um, just because um, I was um, in contact with um, people who were speaking with her. And um, I remember that was a book that was just such a moving book that I wanted to pick it up. You again. went local. I you? went local. <laughs> I'm, you know. That's okay. well, I, you know, I just finished volume four of Nausgaard. I don't know if you're familiar. He's a Norwegian writer. Yeah. He's been translated. He wrote this monumental book. It's classified as fiction, but it's really based on his own life. It's like 6,000 pages long, and there are five volumes. I, I highly that. recommend it. <laughs> it's just fascinating reading. Um, but I mean, as far as the influences on me uh, from a literary point of view, I mean, I love Melville, you know, the kind of Americanism of Melville, uh, Nabokov. What I do in my personal life is, you know, my wife and I live in Sausalito. I do a lot of cycling. I do a lot of woodworking. In fact, I have some marks on my hand from when I was talking to you earlier. Um, so yeah, I love the outdoors and uh, that sort of thing. There's about 30 seconds apiece for you. Uh, sorry, you, Sheila. Sure. Tell the people in Marin why they should vote for you. Yeah. You know, um, I, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, I have this really broad-based experience. I am committed to ensuring that everyone have an equal voice in the courtroom. Um, I don't want to come with an agenda. I don't, I'm not here to come to bring a particular voice. Um, I don't think that's appropriate. I'm here to make sure that everybody have an equal voice. That is of paramount importance. And I think that my, my broad-based background really prepares me for that. Um, the, the other thing that really prepares me for it is the depth of experience that I have. 23 years serving as a lawyer in several different capacities. I've been fortunate enough to argue in front of the California Supreme Court. I have several uh, published decisions. And, and I got to cut you off because Mike needs okay, his and I, 30 sure. seconds. Okay. <laughs> so Larry, I've worked both in civil litigation and in criminal law. I have experience in both of those areas. Mostly though I have experience in the courtroom. I've done over 50 jury trials. I've spent thousands of hours in the courtroom. I've done thousands of hearings and represented thousands of people. There's no better preparation for being a judge than being in the setting in which that judge is expected to do his or her work, and that's what I bring to, to the uh, table here. Well, thank you both for coming here. I'm involved in your, your profession. I think there's, you're two great candidates, and I wish you a lot of luck, uh, regardless of uh, what happens in November for you, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you all around for years here in Marin. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you.